Good morning and welcome to our uh, early morning panel um, on pedagogical approaches, importance, necessity, and role towards publics. Um, one of our panelists, I'll start by saying, uh, Ben Cook is sadly not with us because he uh, apparently lost his passport. Um, so here we are, but, but uh, uh, I think you'll be very interested to hear what our panelists uh, have to say. Um, let me start by introducing myself, Louise Eliasoff. I am an art advisor, but today I am wearing my hat uh, as a board member of Art21. So, um, as I said, I'm wearing my hat here as a board member of uh, an organization called Art21, a nonprofit based in New York. Um, Art21 has existed since 2001. Uh, primarily, we're known for Peabody Award winning PBS broadcast series, uh, Art in the 21st Century. And we also have two uh, very popular ongoing web series, Art 21 New York Close Up and Art 21 Exclusive. Um, we provide public programs, uh, teacher training, and multimedia online resources. The idea of Art 21 initially was to show artists unfiltered, there's no one asking questions. Um, of the artist, the artist is in front of you talking about their life, maybe their children, the inspirations for the work. Um, and the idea is not to rely on <coughs> museum wall text um, or other experts, that the audiences gain the intimate uh, access to artists talking about their lives and their inspiration uh, without any uh, critical filter. Um, so our panelists today, we have um, to my right, François Michaud, who is the chief curator at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. Uh, Good morning. Co-curated a number of exhibitions, um, including one of my favorites, Francis Picabia, uh, Bonnard, uh, perhaps more relevant to our discussions here uh, in this media, Ryan Tricartan and Lizzie Fitch. Um, André Cader, and he recently... With a colleague of mine who is here, ah. Odile Burlero. Oh, very good. <coughs> he doesn't take all the credit. Um, and he recently organized the first retrospective of the Chinese painter uh, Zheng Fanzi. Um, to my left, uh, immediate left, is uh, Javier Ro Rodrigo, who is an arts educator and researcher who developed a pedagogical cultural project uh, Transductores, which we'll hear more about, um, a very much on point of our subject. He's developed workshops and conferences and written extensively on this theme, uh, and um, both within Spain and internationally at venues, including the Institute for Arts Education de la Universidad de Zurich. I don't think they call it that in Zurich, but the University of Zurich, uh, the Reina Sofia, uh, and on and on. Um, uh, I should add, everybody here has very impressive bios. I mean, this is very selective. Huh? Uh, Bjorn Christensen is our, the, our artist voice here at the panel. He's a member of the three-person artist group uh, Superflex, which was founded in 1993, along with Jakob Fender and Rasmus Nielsen, uh, based in Copenhagen. They describe their practice as the provision of tools which affect or influence their social or economic context. Uh, they work within and outside traditional art contexts, collaborating with diverse experts, including architects, designers, engineers, businesses, marketers, artists, etc. So that gives you a little bit uh, of background about, about who we are. Um, I'd like to start by uh, a simple question. When someone, well, this was emailed to me, this, this <coughs> title of the panel, Pedagogical Approaches, Importance, Necessity, and Role Towards Publics. When I got this title, frankly, I said, what the fuck is <laughs> pedagogy? I have no idea what pedagogy is. And I started to Google it. I had to look up on YouTube how to pronounce it. Um, I kid you not. Um, I think perhaps in, in the United States, it's not a word that we use all that often. I knew it had something to do with education. Um, but I would very much like to hear from the panelists how they would define uh, the word. And I would especially like to hear from Javier since he's pretty much spent his life uh, uh, doing so. <laughs> so. So what would you, how would you define the word? Well, I think it's on me. <laughs> 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 Which is a hardly, I mean, controversial question because how it has been discussed for the last two centuries. So it's not a quite new term. 
and actually we were discussing before the panel what it's about pedagogies. So first, I have to say there is like a lot of traditions of pedagogy that came from the 19th century, which is more about instruction and education, and is connected with the industrial revolutions. And the principal aim was to create the new masses of working people for the next generation. So we can think pedagogy in this terms was, was more or less like the science of education applied to a specific uh, political context. But right now, I have to say from my perspective and my heritage, I came more from the framework of critical pedagogy, which is actually connected with the Latin American movements from the 70s and 80s, which are connected with traditions of <coughs> indigenous movements, uh, popular education, rural development and local developments, and, and it has a lot to do with what is called participatory action research, which is another, let's say, trend of the social sciences. So that is more or less uh, how I can say about uh, what's the origin of the meaning of pedagogy. And actually when we use the term pedagogy, we never use it in a, like a single name. We always use it in a plural uh, definition. So we call it pedagogies because we think there is not like one specific definition of pedagogy. There is <coughs> not a right or wrong pedagogy. There is not like a black and white pedagogy. So you have like the critical or radical pedagogy is one side and then you have like the authoritarian or the bad pedagogies on the other side. It's a little bit like the Star Wars with the, <laughs> with the dark side of the force. <laughs> like you are like back, you know, back and forth all the time. So, and if uh, we get into the question about uh, engaging audiences and what does it mean, firstly I have to say that in all the projects we are working right now and we have been working for the last five, even seven years, we do not use the term audiences at all because we think yeah. it's a kind of central European term and it talks a lot about a wide uh, autonomous, let's say, subject, a person, so you can target and you can think that is your public, that is your audience are going to get into the public and it's going to get into the museum and have some kind of aesthetic experience. And for us, this is like a, like a kind of controversial definition of, of, of politics in terms of how do you deal with pedagogies. So what we try to do all the time is to create what we call learning and practice communities. Learning communities means a group of persons that they share knowledge together, they have their own difference, they own different skills, different abilities, different experiences, and they try to come together into a net and from this net, they create uh, what they call dialogical learning. This is not learning about <coughs> instruction or try to uh, literacy someone, but it's a learning created through exchange uh, of knowledges and through dialogue and conversation. So everyone in a community is, in this case, an uh, expert. So we have to say that everyone has their own expertise. And a practice, a practice community is more a, a renovated term that it means people that have some kind of practice-based knowledge and they meet up together to have some kind of re reflexive process in which they want to improve and to share their own practices and create from this a theoretical framework. So the theory came from their own practices and the whole reflections with other partners and with other pals. So for us, that is quite uh, a key term, so learning communities or practice communities as, as opposed to engage or target some kind of specific audiences because we guess you cannot predefine what an audience is going to be. It's impossible. I mean, you are thinking about the social complex and the social antagonist politics. It's impossible to frame that you have like this kind of specific subject matter as an audience and you have to trap the audience and to get it into contact with the museum or with the art of peace. So as I said before, our tradition is based on that, on popular education from the 70s and 80s, uh, from the social movements. And if we look very closely in the 70s and 80s, not only in the specific conjuncture of politics in Spain because of the tra tra transitions, but nowadays as well, because occupied, mo occupied movements and so on, there is like a renewal or renewal of uh, connections of edu popular education on one side, social movements and cultural productions. And that somehow uh, bring me to the, to the next key term, which is we always try to design pedagogical projects. So we do not do educational projects. And this is a quite a specific difference. So what is the difference between education and pedagogy in this uh, scenario? Could be that education is about learning and teaching to a specific subject. So if I'm working in a community setting, I'm going to teach, I don't know, a gypsy community or uh, women to empower them. 
And this is an educational process. I'm thinking about teaching, about learning, and about the strategies and how to come together. But if I think about pedagogical, then I have to think about how we learn together, which is the different politics we are creating together as we uh, raise as a, com a learning community. So we can say that normally uh, the question here, the, the subject matter is about what we learn as people, as educators, as institutions, as cultural producer, or whatever. Um, besides, which is more important to, under, to just to remark, is the pedagogical question is a question about what institution can and can't not or will not learn. So sometimes the question about pedagogy is not about what are we going to learn, but what is possible to learn that we already don't know. Or just to say in another way, what can we unlearn to learn new things? So this is a question about ourselves and our politics, not about teaching someone else or trying to, to access to someone other. And of course, what we are very interested in transducers and all these approaches is about the controversies and potentialities of what was called the educational turn, who was a key term in the 2008 uh, released by Eirut Rogoff in the Anglo-Saxon context, that is quite important. And it has been, uh, let's say, uh, increasingly uh, produced a, a lot of different events, seminars, uh, art projects, uh, art projects are exhibitions and so, mainly from curators and, uh, and art educators, well, artists or groups of artists. But for us, the, the question about the educational turn is about a question about how can we create a new educational turn from the perspective of critical education and mediation teams, not only from the pers perspective of the approach of curators and art producers, but as well trying to learn from the traditions of popular education, social movements, and so on and so on. And this is something we think, and this is one of the first uh, case scenarios we have been dealing with for like the last three or four years with other colleagues, that there is a strong Latin American tradition and even Spanish traditions from the new school and the 20s and 30 movements that it is still somehow in an invisible uh, packet. So we have to unpack it and to think about the connections between the educational term and another traditions of uh, popular education. And just to finish with this kind of first talk, <laughs> then maybe we can discuss how you guys have been doing that in a practical way, because I can assure you we try to do it. <laughs> Another thing is if we have been successful with that, <laughs> is that we are very interested in, uh, as an pedagogical question to think about the controversies and the tensions in cultural politics and in cultural productions. And that means that for us, the pedagogical question is a pedagogical question that refers to the pedagogies of the institutions. So each institution has its own pedagogies. If you just establish a museum in Barcelona or you create a, a, a fair like here, they have a device in which they are communicating knowledge and they are putting people together in a specific space and time. And that is a question about pedagogy as well. So pedagogy is not only the people who are like teachers or who are like workshops, or the, the kind of educational stuff, they are very like uh, wishful thinking and so on. So this is part of the educational uh, question, but the pedagogical question, it refers as well to, to the institutions. It refers as well to a lot of feminist politics traditions from the 60s. Uh, and of course, there's a trend, a uh, very radical trend that is quite new, what is called critical gallery education, not only from UK, but as well uh, a very strong and um, firmly uh, advocacy in Germany and part of Spain and Latin America as well. So I think that's like three of the strands that I think it's important to research and to rethink. What's the meaning of pedagogy in a political approach, uh, which is the tradition of feminist thinking and, educa and popular education movements, and what is the potential and connections with gallery education approaches. I think I will leave it here, maybe, with this That kind of helps so much. That's so much better than Google. I cannot <laughs> tell you. Or Wikipedia. Um, thank you very much. I actually think that brings us very nicely to uh, Bjorn's work, because he also uh, deals so much with, um, I think both of you speak often of interdisciplinary teams and community <laughs> projects. And, uh, and I think that Bjorn's work will, will show you this very much in action, so to speak. So um, we will uh, move things you want to, to me? Bjorn. Yeah. Yes, we want um, you. Andrew I will work. start with uh, a little film. Just gotta wait until he's ready. Then okay. Yes. 
zwingend. So this was a, an introduction from the, another species. Um, it was a commission by the London Science Museum uh, to make a project that, that was dealing with uh, climate change. They developed a new thing called Climate Change Museum. So they wanted us to, to, to try to develop a project that will relate to this. And they had uh, all high-tech equipment and uh, designers that would give us all kinds of tools we would uh, need. But then we, uh, we quite fast learned that uh, by spending a lot of time there, that uh, a lot of uh, groups were present, and particularly uh, children, like students. They will always gather in, uh, or move around in groups of 20, 30. And they found that that was, uh, that, that was the group to, to, to target and to work with. Um, so we developed, a, we developed a manuscript and uh, together with, uh, with, with different specialists within the science museum. So you could sign up for being part of a cockroach tour. So you would uh, dress up as a cockroach, like a group of uh, 20. You would have a cockroach uh, leader who would uh, take you uh, through a tour where you would look at humans. You, and you would look at all the inventions of, of humans. They are craving for uh, getting to space, uh, understanding everything in our society, technologically, and so on and so on. And um, so I think that, that could be an answer. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, for us it's very much, uh, like we never use the term pedagogy, and we also don't use the, like audience. We, we like to talk about the uh, users, uh, and particularly users, in, uh, because users uh, use our tools. We like to talk about tools instead of projects, artworks, and so forth. Because for us it opens up for uh, different interpretations and also use. And again, maybe you can also sense here that it deals then more, more and more about the context. So one, one, one work, one tool can work uh, very differently and be used very differently depending on the implementation and the context. And for each of these contexts, you then decide a specific approach with your collaboration partners. Um, and I have many, many examples of this. Um, but it was just the, the, the first answer to, uh, to, to, to the from early questions here. Um, so for us, it's about uh, making models, examples, because we're not the theorists, we are, we are practi practitioners. And we believe in that uh, the only way that uh, we as individuals can, can really move in any direction is by proposing, is by saying something. By that you say something, you also get a response. And already there you are, you are partaking and not just uh, an audience or listening. So then that's in general uh, the way that we think uh, every individual in our society should be enabled to be able to propose, to act, to, act, to be active in the, in, in the context that you decide to be part of. And then, again, then it depends on uh, like the way you then speak and uh, talk about your, your work depends on the context you want to present it. So, um, for example, we have, uh, we have early on developed a, a, a biogas system, an energy system in the rural Africa, East Africa. <coughs> so when, when we work with the engineers, scientists, economists, we talk in a specific way. When we work within the arts context, we communicate differently. Uh, so again, it, so language changes all the time and augmentations. So it's not just so that you can take one, one proposal and move it automatically into another context. Um, so this is another aspect of it. Um, I, I can present quite a lot of uh, different works. I don't know if you want me to do that now. I think it'd be very interesting <coughs> to see maybe um, 
a community-driven project, yeah, like yeah. Kind of uh, one of them is uh, fairly recent. Uh, it was a co uh, it was it was ready in 2011. We were we won a competition in uh, Copenhagen uh, for a big uh, urban uh, urban area, uh, a one kilometer long uh, stretch, and uh, we worked with uh, architects, and we uh, it was a, it was. The first, what we first received was a list of uh, how many different uh, nationalities live in the area. <coughs> it's the most diverse uh, cultural uh, national nationality-based area in Copen in Denmark. It's uh, 56 different nationalities, and then we got a whole list of uh, wishes and uh, demands from people in the area. They would like to have uh, sports facilities and so on and so forth. So we, from we, we, we it, it was our first uh, public, uh, let's say, public large-scale commission working with uh, infrastructure. Um, but we tried to take some of the methods that we that we use when we, uh, let's say, do uh, exhibition uh, and so forth. So first, first of all, it was very important to create uh, different zones that people would easily relate to or be able to refer to. Co Copenhagen is a quite homogeneous city on many levels. Um, so we first of all we tried to create a place to meet, and that became the one of them became the Red Square. Now it's a reference point for everyone in the city. Um, and then we had the the Black Square, as we call it. Um, and then there was a long, long uh, green uh, bicycle path. Um, the most important aspect was that we uh, we looked at all the objects, all the the, the wishes from, from from the public, like what should what should be in this area. And also, we looked at what is demanded from the from the from the planners. So all of the all of the objects that is in the city space, uh, benches, uh, lamps, and so on, uh, in this park, uh, come from somewhere else. So our approach was to uh, was to engage with the people living in the area, um, and ask them to propose uh, city objects. So benches, uh, lamps. Uh, uh, sewage covers uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we received. So we went through a lot of different uh, ways of doing it. Uh, the city has a specific way of doing it. They uh, they call in a meeting and then they set down a community group that then represents everyone. Unfortunately, the ones who always uh, meet up in these groups are mostly men between uh, 40 and 60. Uh, very few women. Uh, no youngsters. No elderly. And this we found very fast quite problematic uh, because most of these guys would not really use the uh, user park. The, most, the ones who use a park mostly are the youngsters and are the elderly who have the time and also uh, they're willing to, to engage with public space. So we did something that we uh, called extreme citizen involvement. So what we did was that we, uh, that we, went, with, uh, we went with different uh, groups in the area. Um, and went to them and said, okay, uh, think about an object, uh, think about something that is relevant for you uh, as a reference, as a memory. Um, so for example, we met up with, uh, with young uh, Palestinian girls uh, who had never been to Palestine, but always had the, you know, the dream for a nation and, and so forth. And then we went to, we said, okay, let's go. So we went to Palestine together with them to find something that was important for them to bring back to, uh, to, uh, to Denmark. And uh, two, two girls went with us, it was Rasmus, uh, one of the other guys in Superflex went with them. And for them it was important to bring back soil, uh, to represent uh, their, their nation. So we, uh, so we uh, brought back uh, a lot of soil and uh, created the hill uh, in, in, in the black uh, square, where everyone is now uh, standing on top of. And, uh, and uh, some, Jacob went, to, went with young, uh, young Thai boxers in the area, went to, uh, went to Thailand, and they wanted the boxing ring, Thai boxing ring. And this is the first time in Denmark that we have an outdoor boxing ring. So now there's a permanent uh, boxing ring uh, outside. Um, I went to uh, Jamaica with some young uh, hip hoppers from the area. They wanted to have a Jamaican sound system. Uh, you know, this is a, this big wall of a sound that is very loud. So we said, okay, let's go. So we, I was there for two weeks with these guys, traveling around, uh, experiencing different types of sound systems. Then finally they found one. And then, uh, and then they decided this is what we want. So we went back to Denmark, uh, had an engineer develop a sound system that could uh, handle snow and so forth. So now there's a gigantic <laughs> sound system that you can go to with your uh, iPhone and automatically you can, uh, you can start a party uh, from 10 to 11 in, at night, 10 in the morning to 11 at night. 
You can imagine, we, we never understood what, why the city said yes to this. Because uh, there are so many problems, uh, problems in, the, in, the, in, the, in an approach like this. So, but, but, but they did. Uh, I think it's mostly because we always, uh, our approach to partners is always that, yes, someone may first say no. But then you, instead of just getting angry or imposing on them, you start a conversation slowly. And in that conversation, uh, most likely you will, uh, you will find a solution. But foremost of all, you do it first, and then you have the trouble afterwards. Because if you, if you ask for permission, then most of the time, things don't happen. So that's why we always, also in many other types of works, uh, first you do it, and then you take the battle. I think that's actually a wonderful example of, of engaging, I won't call them an audience, but a participant. Mm. Uh, uh, in, in a way that, I mean, she really spoke of the essence of what this was. I love the quote where she says, yes, I think I get it. Mm -hmm. I think what I, I get what you're <coughs> after. And there was none of this sort of art speak or anything, you know, but she was truly involved in a, in a very uh, poetic and uh, in a way that couldn't have been deeper, if you will. Um, yeah, it happens often that when you, uh, when you go out to the, to, <coughs> to the public, for example, as, as a city planner, you ask them, okay, so what would you like to happen here? Most of the time, there's just a big speech bubble on top, and then you do workshops and yada, 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 but you follow certain methods that some consultant has developed. And often you get the same results all the time, again and again and again. Um, so we've experienced again here that it's basically not that many people who have a proposal for a, for a sewage cover or a trash bin and so on. So it was a lot, uh, a lot of work in, uh, in uh, trying to go to all these different types of communities, meeting people in the street. Uh, but then where it had the biggest results was when you really took the extreme uh, commitment, uh, basically, to, to go all the way. Um, and this has proven both for us and, uh, and, and for the guys in the area. Uh, it has created a certain uh, new type of ownership in the area where people take more care, they have created a, another level of responsibility towards a uh, public space. Um, and this was a dream scenario of us. I, I live in the area myself, my son goes to kindergarten in that area, so I see it every day. Um, so so yeah, that, that, that's, that's one way of uh, dealing with the public space and, uh, and engaging primarily, as you also say. You engage and you uh, actuate through having, uh, let's say, a shared goal or shared interests. Um, in the middle of uh, rooms. And video for a long time um, has entered that space in its specific way. In a, uh, you, could, you could say, um, quoting Don Judd, that video is a specific object. And in the very beginning in the 60s, 70s, um, people working in video uh, we're always comparing it to a uh, sculpture because uh, video was first a uh, monitor or a TV. And Free flat screen. Yes. Uh, and also, uh, you, could, uh, you could give some, somebody a videotape and you could um, see video uh, on your TV at home. And this is part of the experience. What is video in the museum? What is video in a more personal way to um, watch something, watch a film? Uh, and now it's a bit different because of the web, because you can uh, get a, f a very few seconds of a film or a video specifically sp specific uh, to the web design. I, I mean, things that have been uh, created for uh, YouTube, um, YouTube or uh, Vimeo, and that, in general, are very short. Uh, it's more difficult to uh, see a long film on uh, your computer than to see it in a um, movie theater. And even now, this remains, uh, uh, this remains something very important. The computer is um, based on a um, very short time, uh, a, a few sequences of uh, 
screenings. Screenings you decide to or not, or to stop and to go back to something else, etc. In the museum space, it's not a movie theater, or some artists try to uh, combine both, or to work with the um, specific place of uh, one channel screening with banks, uh, chairs, etc., and to stay there. But at any rate, when you enter the room where there is a video, and it, especially if it's a video um, that needs time, a long film with a beginning and, and an end, uh, you, uh, well, you go uh, somewhere, you, and behind the door, there is a film that has already um, begun. And the main problem for uh, visitors, for uh, all of us, is when to enter the room to see the film. Because when we, uh, when we were used to going to a uh, movie, we needed a ticket. And we knew when we could see the film. But in a um, museum, you can't. So many artists work with it and consider video not as something that, is, that has got a beginning and an end, but something that you can experience at any, any, at any time. That comes back to uh, the idea of a sculptural uh, work or even a, a picture, painting. I remember, for instance, um, the, um, the Venice Biennial of 2001, the second that Harald uh, Zeman uh, curated. Um, in the first, in 1999, uh, there were no uh, videos or very few. Uh, but um, in the second, there were many, many screenings. And I remember that uh, we were... Uh, with a museum, uh, with many uh, colleagues, we went to uh, Venice in a single day trip. So it's very funny because uh, uh, s some uh, of us uh, decided to stay and to uh, get um, to pay for one night more because the invitation uh, was just uh, one day. And um, I did the experience, it was a bit. Um, Stupid, probably, probably because uh, it would have been uh, more interesting to uh, stay more and not to go and return to Paris on the same day. But I remember this as a very specific experience um, when I had to decide uh, to see or not to see. And it was totally individual, totally subjective. But uh, I knew that if I wanted to um, spend time in front of a video, I wouldn't see another film. But in a way, uh, I had to, to make this choice. And I think that any visitor is supposed to do it. And probably it is um, the first experience you have when you are uh, in front of, it, of a video. So what you can do as a museum curator or as um, uh, someone who has to talk uh, to anybody. Uh, it's very difficult to explain a video when the video is on and you have to talk because there is the sound of uh, the channel and uh, there is what you have to, to, to say. Uh, in general, people who do that uh, in educational um, uh, w uh, target uh, device um, would stay in the room just before the room where the film is, and try to explain something, and then bring people in in the room. But perhaps you can't let people see uh, the old film, because that needs time, and you can't stop speaking. You must, can, uh, you must stop speaking when the video is on, and you want uh, the, uh, the, the audience to see it. And um, it's something very difficult. In general, I think that the best way to experience it is to be um, alone and to enter the gallery uh, when you want. And perhaps to know nothing about 
Yes, sometimes, uh, yes, you're right. I don't know, for me, I always find that mm. that's, even when I go to the cinema, I don't read mm. reviews beforehand, ever. Mm. I mm. want to go in fresh, and I think that's somewhat true. And then perhaps read a wall text in a museum after you've seen it and understand, maybe you don't even know the artist, who, who the artist is. Do you have um, programs mm. around video as a media it, within the museum, the educational programs that support this that are maybe somewhat separate or? In the educational program are based, oh, are based on um, our exhibitions, pro, uh, our exhibitions program. So if there are video exhibitions or video screenings in the collection, of course, um, uh, the ed educational team includes it uh, as uh, part of um, what is uh, said about the museum, the, uh, what is on. But um, we have been uh, working and thinking with my colleagues and Odile uh, in particular about how to um, accompany um, or screenings and or installations. For instance, um, when you are alone without anybody accompanying you, uh, you are in a dark room and sometimes you need explanations anyway. You need texts. And the problem is uh, how to read a text in a dark room. You can have labels with uh, white characters and um, in general, they are not um, big enough uh, to let people read, uh, or it's difficult because you need to be close to the um, to the light of the projector of the screen, etc. And um, this is not absolutely uh, convincing, but anyway, you need it. And the other poss possibility is to have someone speaking, but mm -hmm. this has a result I was uh, speaking of. interferes with the medium itself, yeah. in, a, in mm, a yes. sense. You're speaking over or you're writing mm. over in the light. Uh, uh, the I actually would be curious to ask you first, and, and, and all of the panelists, um, actually I think neither of you would like the word audience, so I'll let you define what or what is not an audience, because I, I think, but for you, are there, um, Audiences that, uh, how do you define an audience? Who are your audiences and are there audiences mm -hmm. that you don't reach that you would like to reach? I would say this mm -hmm. in general, not, not l let's, let's keep this open to, to everything in, the, in, in your museum. In fact, the audience is, uh, well, the audience of a museum of modern and contemporary art. So people of s different ages, um, and I don't think there is a very specific audience in the museum context uh, towards video. There are people interested in contemporary art. Video is part of contemporary art, so uh, they, uh, they will watch parts of the video screened. Um, sometimes, and perhaps this is a this is the question, uh, the, 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 uh, the question you, um, you ask. Do they reach uh, what you, uh, your target or don't they? And um, if they are looking for something very easy, uh, very direct, uh, something you can see just with um, a glimpse and, and go back to... Um, return or go to the, the second room, to another gallery, etc. Video is not uh, the correct thing to do this. There is a question about this, and uh, probably, probably uh, it's important to have this discussion here in uh, a fair and festival uh, devoted to video for a long time, where people coming are this specific video audience. You are this audience, this kind of audience. Um, but in the main contemporary art context, I don't know if it is now as important as it was in a very um, um, close past. Mm -hmm. For instance, 
around 2000, when any um, international exhibition, uh, be it all, etc., meant to have many video screenings. How would you define, let's hear from Javier first, how would you define an audience? Or you don't, maybe, I don't think you probably like the, the term. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Okay, good, good. Let let's have some, some controversy here. Um, mm -hmm. And I know uh, Bjorn doesn't like the, the, the word audience. I, 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 can, I can answer first. You yeah. can. Um, <coughs> I think one of the, one of the approaches that, that, that we made uh, a decision, uh, I think quite early when we started making films, was that, uh, that uh, there was a problem with, with this, <coughs> with, the, with the economic system around uh, artworks in general, mm. but particularly about films, film works, because they come in editions. And, uh, and the economic system around that has developed uh, sort of that you need to have an exclusivity. When you, when you buy a film, you have an exclusivity mm. to it, and so on and so on. Of course, there are four or five others, but for us, we, we basically were able to persuade quite early. Uh, I think the first time we did a film called Flutter McDonald's or Bernie Cardo member, that, that, the, that the institutions who would, who would be part of uh, co-funding it would, would accept that the film would also be available on so many other platforms mm. in high quality, not just a glimpse and so on. And the first, our gallerists and so on, they were saying, no, 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 it's not possible because then they don't want to pay the price and so on. But it turned out, again, by making the example, that it has absolutely no problem. Because you go into a museum and you see a specific work, let's say the Florida McDonald's, we, we want it to be, as I said, a sculptural uh, experience, like a, it has to be a sort of a space, as if you're inside the McDonald's restaurant. But we also let others download it, show in uh, youth clubs, uh, wherever they want to show it in high quality. And there's absolutely no problem in that we have different levels mm -hmm. of, of, of usage and experience. And this again goes to general uh, terms in our society. We, we, there's so much focus on, on, on maintaining this exclusivity for objects, design, whatever, and then we forget that there are several different levels, different types of economies in our society. So why not let someone have this cheaper over here? Because someone else can pay it more expensively here. There's absolutely no problem about it. As long as you, you make it available, because this is our interest, is that people watch it, they interact with it, they use it, they readapt. For example, the burning car, uh, we get Every second month we get a, a, someone writes to us, oh, I, f I found your film online and I've used it uh, for our music video. So then there's a heavy metal, insanely bad music, but using our, <laughs> our film. And then you're like, okay, it doesn't matter because when, uh, when we present the work in an arts context and so on, we basically sign it. We basically say, this is how we would like to present it in this context. And it doesn't matter that, that you use it otherwise. So I think that's, that, that, that's a very important uh, knowledge. It's important, important, I think, in general, that there should not be that fear. Because it is about m enabling it uh, for, for, for people to use it and watch it, and also at different times. Hmm. I think for me, the, it's the first time at Loop. It's a, it's a perfect setting. It's a wonderful that you have such a focused. And every, 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 uh, every room has the same conditions, hmm. more or less, right? And this uh, enables also for the audience, they, again, or audience uh, to, to interact uh, in the way they want to. It says uh, the film takes 10 minutes. Do I want to use 10 minutes? Sure. Yes, why not? It's in a cozy area, it's nice. I can come back in two, three days and watch the other, the other ones. Or I select, as I did, I read a little bit and then someone says, oh, this is probably not something I want to go into. So I, I pass it, same as I would do on Netflix or whatever. Uh, so, I, so I like this, uh, the way that it's, uh, that it's set up here. It's a, it's a perfect user. Setting, I would say. Could, could but again, it's different from then going into a museum show where you would see our, let's say, our, our, our film, The Working Life, presented. It's very different. It's, it, then it's in another context. And we want it to be in a much larger screen because we like the physical presence of a one-to-one -one person yeah. and, and so on. But it doesn't ruin our work at all. It's just another setting and context. Yeah. I was wondering if you could also refer to this lovely woman going to Mallorca. I was very touched by that. <coughs> is she part of the audience? I mean, she's interacting with the work. In a sense, she's one of the artists, uh, in a sense. In a sense, is that what an audience means in this uh, in today? Because it means the total involvement of the community, their input in the work. Mm. <coughs> Again, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would never uh, put, I would never put that, I would never put that label on her to be an artist. 
uh, if, if she would want to be it and uh, if she describes it to her friends at, that she was part of an uh, artistic uh, process, it's fine. But I would never put that label on her. But is she an uh, audience then? Uh, no, she, she's definitely a participant. She's definitely a user. Um, Which is the word you prefer <coughs> to audience? Yeah, I but, but user, uh, user is for, as well. It's, it's yeah. you know, if a mentor, mentor, you say it so many times, then people thought, oh, okay, uh, maybe that's something <laughs> about it. But what we also did with the, with the Super Keelan, the Spark, is that we created an app. Uh, we, we, we did it on our own uh, reasons. The, the city didn't want to pay it, so we paid for an app. So basically all the films are available. Each of the objects uh, physically in the park, they have a signage saying in, the, in, the, in Danish and also the native language, uh -huh. uh, let's say a bench, says in Danish, and then also says in Spanish, and also where it comes from. So you can just enjoy the bench, you can read the little sign, and then it takes you to uh, Mexico, wherever it comes from. And you can go to the app and you can uh, read a story <coughs> about this type of bench hmm. in somewhere else. So there's uh, all these layers of, uh, of, of, of adding information, we can also just enjoy the bench. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another type of approach where you use the film or the, or the, or the possibilities of, uh, of, of new information tools. Okay. But you can also just stay with the old one, which is just a bench. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. And, and how, would, <coughs> how yes. would you not use the word audience? Well, <laughs> what I'm going to show is a, a graphic about the politics of a specific project we are working right now. Um, actually, it's quite... Um, can enlarge it? <coughs> Uh, in Actually, this is a brand new graphic from Tabacaleras Kuncha, and it happens that the director of the center is quite ra right in the audience. <laughs> so it's a teaser graphic, because it's the first time I just saw this kind of graphic. And I want to explain how we work in terms of audiences, because we do not uh, try to read audiences. We do not try to even create audiences. But what we try to do is to cultivate nets. That's, to, that's just to say, to farm a uh, basis of, of ground in which then, after two or three years, we will have our own plants and products and so. So this is a long-term research. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the aesthetical component or the reception of one subject uh, in front of the piece of art. It doesn't matter if it's an installation or it's a piece of video art. So what we try to do is that we have like several meetings, we have proposals, we have collaborations, and we have human resources. And we use all of that to work with the specific collectives or proposals or initiatives from the neighborhoods around Tabacalera, which is the cultural center, international cultural center of creation in Donosti, San Sebastián, Basque country. So we have been working for the last almost seven months as the mediation staff, mediation project, in this kind of terms. So it's not about how to reach uh, audiences, it's before the museum is going to be open. We have been cultivating the futures, nets, who are going to collaborate with us. And maybe from these potentials, then in the future we have maybe an audience, but maybe we have users and collaborators and so on and so on. So what we, who, what we try to do all the time is try to use this kind of collective initiatives and our own tools to create what we call uh, collaborative designs. Because it means we do not uh, have a package of a project and try to work to with a community to share the packet, to, try to communicate the packet, like some kind of residence artist or the typical community-based art intervention in which you are an artist, you have a target group with the community, and you work for the community. We try to do just the opposite. We create with the communities the conditions to develop projects. And in these creations, we create the situations in which we can learn from each other, which is the different projects you want to get involved. So what we do is we use tools. So we have what we call local nets or activated nets, people who are actually working in the communities, maybe with video, maybe with education. They have their own pieces of video. They have their own productions and their own cultural knowledges. Then we have ideas all together. <laughs> then we have context, which is this map, in terms of a strategy how to approach to the territories. And then we have a lot of tools. When we were drawing this graphic, first we put a lot of uh, patriarchal macho tools, like a hammer and so, and then we realize we have to put even cooking tools. <laughs> because it's important to cook nets, <laughs> and not only to build things. <laughs> Just to say that. Then we put papers and magazines as well, because we think they are our tools, and the community tools and knowledge as well. So what we are trying to do is, we have uh, meetings, we have workshops, seminars, different uh, stretches in which we gather the people together, 
and we try to, to meet up situations or learning situations in which we have the conditions to learn from each other and from this to create an educational project, a community or mediation project with a cultural center. Then we have the accidents, the projects, the things we want to do, and we put this because it's a project we are doing with a, with a platform which is like the Egea the, Bicidic, which is like the coordination of the whole social entities of one specific neighborhood. And we're working with them to, do, to develop a specific uh, piece of, of, let's say, mobile furniture, which is kind of a public intervention, intervention uh, which has some kind of, uh, let's say, co-design with the groups of people of this community. Then we have a, a local group for architects that are working with participatory planning and so, so we put them, them all together. And then we put it as well another three other dimension of the, the situation or the learning situation is Iriki Labs, which is like the kind of maker lab or media maker lab, which is a part of Tabacalera. And we're working all together to produce this kind of mobile furniture that is going to be aimed for the community. So they are going to use it in their own terms as a users. But it's not that they are only users, they are pro users, because they are in the conditions of the design of the device. And at the same time, we're using this situation to create and design uh, an own device for ourselves as the educational team. So we will have like two open source devices, just to say that. And then we think all the time in long-term situation. And that is what we put uh, like a calendar or planning because it's not that we're only thinking in 2013, that is when we started, but we're always thinking in two or three year long-term situations. So when we did this device, we're thinking in how they can manage the device in two years. <coughs> But this is going to be the different <coughs> managements and multiplications and spreading outs of this device and how they, come, they are going to, to work with the device. So for us, creating this kind of local nets and supporting uh, this kind of collaborative designs is the way in which we can maybe create the new audiences that we already don't know what they are. And maybe they are not called audiences and they're called communities, partners, or whatever. Or maybe we have to even make up a term or a new word. Maybe the thing we are creating at, at last is to create public spheres mm -hmm. in the terms of spaces in which we can think about democracy, culture, and society all together. And maybe this is the, our aim as mediation team, to create public spheres with people and to rethink the role of the museum as a public sphere. Hmm. And that's all. Very interesting. Bjorn uh, and I spoke yesterday about also <coughs> the, the future. It's one thing to, to lay out these projects, to to set up these communities, but you have to ensure their longevity. Mm. And uh, maybe you can speak a little bit about that in your experience in terms of some of these, <coughs> specific to some of these artworks that we've seen. Yeah, um, like some of you may know that in the, in the, <coughs> in the later, in, in the mid 90s and upwards, there was a, there was a big uh, boom of uh, social platforms. There were all kinds of uh, exhibitions, uh, and we were also part of that uh, social platform productions, and uh, <coughs> and and all the like all group shows and so on really wanted this social platform that would uh, and it meant that you would have an engagement by the by the audience uh, on on some level. Um, we we also went along with it and uh, and then uh, the first time you just uh, you set it up and you use uh, one week or so in wherever you are traveling to and then you try to uh, try to uh, train the people you're working with in in, in, in activating it in, in, in also maintaining it different types of platform for example we did a uh, did a uh, work called Super Channel which was an uh, which was uh, um, sorry sorry sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. This was another conference somewhere else, but I'm just uh, gonna find it. So it was it was an internet uh, <coughs> internet TV platform we developed in '99, uh, um, enabling enabling people to uh, <coughs> communities in particular to broadcast and interact uh, uh, live, <coughs> both in the sorry, <coughs> both both in the, both in the studio, so the setting it would set up, but also online. And back in 99, uh, you had uh, 56K modems, and maybe you had a dualized end. Not all of you may know what that means, but it means that it was a very, very, very uh, little, uh, little possibility of broadcasting. But we, we managed. Um, so basically, it was looking like this in, in uh, simple terms, a camera, a microphone, computer, and an uh, internet connection. And the first, first ones were experiments in a little studio. We invited everyone, uh, psychologists, to discuss 
this new possibility of uh, could say uh, that you had a different you had a center where you're producing from, but then you had uh, the people interacting in the chat, and then you had the ones who were just viewing the unknown gigantic mass. So some came into the studio, and they thought they had you know millions of viewers, they automatically because it was the internet, so potentially accessible for everyone. So people like uh, be behaving as if there was a million viewers, and sometimes it was like 20. You know, most likely it was five, because it was very <laughs> difficult to, uh, to to connect and so on. Um, so uh, these uh, these uh, psychologists really went very deep into and created the uh, theories around it. Uh, they call it the situflex. Was uh, like you were, you were, it was very uh, like your 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 experiences were very uh, situation based. It was where you were sitting, where how you were experiencing. If you were in the studio, you would, you would be able to interact directly. But because we had chat with the with the with the live broadcasting, we also uh, asked the producers to <coughs> relate to it directly. So not just something like running as they do on TV and so on now still. It just runs next to it, maybe if it does, or it's very selected. So they, they would have to react. So the, so, the, so the show could change completely direction if someone on chat had a, had a, had a very important uh, input. Um, so again, back to the, so uh, one, one of the, the first implementation was in a, in a, in a, in a high rise flat in Liverpool. There were 70 blocks that were supposed to gonna be knocked down or refurbished. So it created really a, a very nervous uh, community of, uh, of, uh, of residents in all these blocks. So we implemented a, a, a studio inside a, inside a community flat with, with sofas, uh, very cozy and so on. That's, that's, that's how they wanted it. Uh, they all, ex most of the people living there are between 60 and 90 years. They were looking at the TV, nothing happened. It's, on, it's not on TV, it's on the computer. So then, um, and then what, what uh, fact the organization worked with uh, in Liverpool, they fast understood that they really had to engage very heavily into it. So they hired uh, people to work with, uh, with, with the pensioners elderly every day. So they were like seriously uh, involvement. And this uh, enabled that it actually has been going on, it has been going on since, uh, two, since 2000 and it stopped last year. So it's insanely long uh, arts project that really uh, worked very well and developed into uh, later on many more channels opened up in community flats uh, in Liverpool. And then they, then they just took over from us. And then they called it Tenant Spin and they were just running it on their own. You can see this old lady there, she's 95 years, Vera. Her hands are, you know, swollen, but she was like standing with this uh, microphone, and uh, oh. so they did all kinds of crazy experiments. Uh, you can see uh, one of the ladies one was wanted to meet Sean Connery, so they uh, they, uh, <laughs> they they basically invited the lookalike. Uh, someone wanted to meet uh, Kate. She wanted to meet uh, John Cleese, so there was a lookalike Cleese, and uh, it was just uh, hilarious, uh, fun, continuous uh, exchange. And they did things that we could never have imagined. Um, BBC came and broadcasted live from the studios because all of a sudden you had a community that had a strong voice. So the, so the board of the HAT, the Housing Association Trust, they had to come into the studio. And then the, the tenants were just like bouncing her, like what is gonna happen, uh, what's going on? And then the news, local news would report from that studio. Imagine a little flat, a little studio in a, in, in a housing block. Um, but what you also asked before is about that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we would, uh, for example, in, uh, in Vienna, we set up, uh, it was uh, just when Jörg Haider was elected, um, we set up a studio outside the uh, Kunsthalle Vienna, and we, together with the Kunsthalle Vienna, we hired a person who would run it, and really it was a discussion about Europe, not about uh, the political situation in Austria, but in general Europe. So it was very good in the first three, four days, but then, then the institution, just uh, left her alone, even though it was linked outside the, 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 the institution, so they just left her alone. So there was no help, no assistance, nothing. So this was just one example of that. They really wanted the social engagement, but they moved on to the next show. And this is one of the main problems, I think, uh, about making active work, that, that uh, you know, the institution moves on, unless they understand the responsibility that lies in, in, in creating serious interaction with the public. So is uh, one of your goals to make interactive works, is it to uh, empower, first to set up an infrastructure <coughs> and empower those sometimes, who are sometimes, taught yeah, to run yeah. it themselves? Sometimes. sometimes in this situation it was, uh, it's, it's not something we always 
mm-hmm. want to do it because again it depends on the on the, the context. context. We also sometimes course. you know do a film, that's it, and nothing more. People can in, in, interpret it whatever they want to it, and we don't say much about the content because we believe that 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 film should be as open as possible for interpretation and use and, and so on. So again, it depends so much on the on, on your interest. Um, but I think that uh, foremost as an, as an institution, again, there's also a big difference in public institutions and private that's funded a, that's institutions. A, that's a very good there's point. a very big mm-hmm. difference in, uh, in yeah. your responsibility towards uh, the public, mm-hmm. towards how you, how you engage with the public. Uh, and that is then a much more important discussion maybe. Mm-hmm. And again, relating to the context. That, that, that is a, a very good point. How that's true, and that make me remind of some experience we uh, did <coughs> with uh, our colleague Ansel Ricobrist, trying to um, create special contacts, especially with artists working in uh, the same way you address. Um, and for instance, I remember the exhibition we had, not exactly in the museum because the museum was closed, at a time for work, but in um, a wonderful place uh, called uh, the Couvent des Cordeliers, uh, a former convent, part of a convent, uh, who, which was also um, a pla- an important place during the revolution. It's uh, in the Quartier Latin. And for two years, uh, we used it as an exhibition place. And for instance, uh, we had. Um, I think an extraordinary exhibition of uh, Recrit di Ravenica, uh, which was uh, recreating, as he did uh, in other contexts, um, most of his, Im- his important exhibitions elsewhere, but there, w- there was nothing to see. So no video, no video at all. And Philippe Pareno was invited to participate in the project, but without a video, but um, a performance with two actors. Uh, he wrote just the text. And people from the, the educa- educational service of the museum uh, were taking the public, touring in the show, going from one place. We just built walls. and. Uh, the person who talked was supposed to make uh, the visitors' um, experience feel uh, even um, uh, very uh, physically feel uh, what was uh, happening in that place. And you know that Rikriti Ravanija often works with cooking, so you had to, um, uh, to smell. Uh, if, even if there were, uh, was nothing. I think it was one of the most um, successful experience in relationship with uh, the public. <coughs> um, would anyone like to ask any questions? We, we, we need to wrap up relatively soon. Um, and I'm sure the, if anyone has questions specifically for, for the panel in general or for a specific member of the panel, don't be shy. Oh, there we are. Thank you, just for the sake of breaking <laughs> this kind of shyness. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, thanks to all the panelists. Um, I have a question about the, um, the Superflex project, the park. Um, and maybe this question is motivated by ignorance, so I apologize in advance. But I have the feeling that it's different from the other projects you have talked about, in the sense that is, it creates, even though it wasn't the, maybe the aim of the project, but it creates a, a subtle effect of theme park. Did, did you ever consider that, that? Or were you concerned about that, uh, maybe unwanted effect of a theme park, or, a, or even cultural tokenism? I mean, lacking political representation or lacking political, political recognition, then we have cultural recognition in the form of a particular bench or, or other objects. And I let aside the uh, kind of cultural meaning that the bull of Osborne has in Spain, because that will raise another debate that it's not maybe important here, but some of those objects can be problematic 
from different perspectives, even in the same community where, where they come from. And consensus and representation also is a debate here. But uh, yeah, also having into, in mind that pedagogy has to do also with the construction of a subject, a political subject. And then I wonder what kind of political subject is constructed in this park. And I, I, I repeat that it, it is a very different project from the other ones who have, you have talked about. And that makes that, that one like more, I don't know, worrying for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think it's, first of all, not possible to cover, cover all the aspects that you are, that you are <laughs> asking for, uh, for any reasons. Uh, first of all, no, we are not afraid that it becomes a theme park. Um, because uh, Copenhagen is, as I said before, extremely homogeneous. So uh, in Copenhagen, there you get a list of five benches you can choose from in the whole city. So it was a response to that also. It was to challenge the way that the city is designed, that, that, that it should be much more uh, complex as the population also is complex. Um, so that was one attempt, one, one experiment again, to try to uh, to create another sort of involvement, uh, representation, uh, commitment, and uh, maybe also a, um, a, a, a wish for taking more care of public space. Um, there were a lot, a lot of conflicts, uh, also directly political. Um, most there's a lot of uh, immigrants living in the area, uh, mostly from the Arab Arab world. And for example, we wanted to uh, also represent Israel in this, so uh, there was a big discussion whether that could happen or not. Uh, but then a lot of the representatives from mosques and so on, they went in and they, they actively participated and said, of course we should have, uh, and, and so on. Um, so there, again, it, 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 it all relies very much on your commitment, your, your engagement uh, with so many different levels. And again, you have to compare it with, it, it's somehow on another scale, as you, as you write, because it is politics. And this is a conceptually planned park, uh, and maybe also quite rigid, um, because it has a certain way of dealing with uh, dealing with public space. It's not uh, inviting a guerrilla-style uh, gardening uh, parks and so on. That's another direction. This is a, an assignment, and from our point of view, it was a way of uh, challenging the way that you normally uh, engage with uh, public planning. Um, so, yeah, um, if, if, if you are there every day, for example, uh, my favorite thing is that there's some swings from Iraq, uh, and every day you see next to each other uh, some uh, young Arab uh, family, uh, one with total uh, veil, uh, next to a hipster family, uh, next to, uh, yeah, and so on and so on, uh, like old guys and so on, they basically sit and swing together. And this is one of the few places I would experience that in, uh, in, in Copenhagen. Again, take in mind that Copenhagen, again, this is, even though it's 56 different nationalities in that area, it's a very particular area. Um, but just to give you another example, we, we went, after that we were invited for the Sharjah uh, Biennial uh, last year uh, to create something similar. So they gave us uh, the possibility of working in a big uh, urban area. Um, <coughs> and what we did was that we, um, in our research, we found out that uh, a lot of the migrant workers uh, from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and so forth, uh, it's mostly men who go and work there for different uh, contract periods, and most of them are not allowed to, to, to gather in, uh, in, in, in public space, uh, in, in bigger groups, or bring out chairs and so on out in the public. So this we found very problematic, and that became the starting point for how we, how we uh, developed uh, this, this area. Um, so what we did was that we, that we uh, asked uh, all these migrant workers, people living in the area, to propose uh, objects that, that, that was based on memory. Um, and our, our, our motivation was underneath that we would somehow be able to formalize public space that would be accepted by the, by the, by the ruler, by the, by the system. Um, so uh, and this is the, called Bank Street. So this, there's this old, uh, old uh, castle. Uh, and it all used to be a desert. Uh, so what we first thought, okay, let's, uh, let's bring it back to its, 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 its origin. So we, um, so we basically um, created a desert, desert uh, 
as, as the base uh, build of the material that you have in urban space, so it's, uh, you'll see it in a moment, so it's uh, asphalt and creating these dunes. And then we, uh, together with the Sharjah Art Foundation, which we, we, they are extremely committed uh, locally, so we went out and asked all like, guys from different areas, uh, different nationalities and, uh, and, and, and social levels also, again. Um, so for example, there was a uh, Bangladeshi who wanted to have a badminton field. This, this uh, girl had uh, at some point lived in uh, Portugal. She found an old video. Her father had filmed her playing on this uh, dinosaur in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Lisbon. Uh, and so forth. And then we uh, copied these uh, objects and modified and copied them uh, into this, uh, this uh, urban, urban uh, area. And, and what happened uh, immediately was because there are, no, there are no, none of these spaces around. Maybe there's a little uh, playground somewhere, but no one goes there. And this is in the very center. And uh, all of a sudden, you would, you would see uh, Emiratis uh, hanging out with, uh, with a group of Afghanistan migrant workers. So that, that for us was, uh, was, was, was what, what we were interested in, challenging the normal ways of interaction uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quite problematic or in a, in a context where, where there's very big difference in what you can do and what you can't do. So for us, we, uh, we saw it as, as, as a means of uh, uh, formalizing public space that would, that would create potential new meetings and uh, exchanges. Um, so that's, that's, so uh, this, this, this is one example of uh, how, one is, how one can deal with it. But, but, but I share many of your concerns also in the whole uh, process of, uh, of making this. Uh, this. This is very interesting because, of course, this is a population that is largely ignored by yeah. the government, the Nepalese, mm. the Bangladesh, uh, some of whom are living in very, very difficult conditions mm -hmm. simply to construct this, these yeah. new cities. Uh, so I think that's very interesting that they suddenly have a voice. <coughs> yeah. uh, well, of course, this, uh, it, it's, uh, and, and most of them did, neither, did not believe that, that their proposal would be taken I'm serious sure. and so on. But, uh, but for us, it was most important that it was able to, we were able to create this, uh, formalize this space that, that you could all of a sudden meet in. Mm -hmm. And again, you would, uh, this badminton field, they would go there every, every night to play. Fantastic. Uh, so it gave them a chance to meet and not only, you know, hide somewhere else. Um. I mean, that's <coughs> a theme that keeps coming up in this panel, I think, is about creating communities, uh, which we have, I mean, Loop in itself is a community, isn't it? It's a, a sort of meeting place for, for all of us to share ideas and exchange ideas. Um, so I think this is very much in line with the, the sort of theme of our panel. Does anyone else have any questions? Because we are at 11.30, I believe there's, ah, 11.30 on the dot. Um, there's a, an award being given. I've forgotten what the acronym for the award is, but you can tell us. <laughs> well, no, uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you to you, Luis. Thank you to Francois. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Bjorn. I think we had a very interesting conversation. You know, when you get to be defied and challenged, you know, since uh, on the very notions and questions that we have uh, set up in order to start this debate, I think it's very important and we all learn.